Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're going to run through and give our thoughts on AMD's Computex 2021 announcements. Their keynote is just finished and we have all the details thanks to a pre-briefing a bit earlier. Now to be fair, AMD did say that not everything from the keynote would be covered in our pre-briefing, so fingers crossed we haven't missed anything and if we did I'll pin a note in the comments below. On the menu today are three main announcements. We've got Fidelity FX Super Resolution, new Ryzen 5000 APUs for their desktop, and RX 6000M discrete GPUs for laptops. That first one, FSR, is absolutely massive news, so let's tackle it right at the start. One thing that AMD has lacked for quite some time now is a true competitor to Nvidia's DLSS, but that is changing this month with the launch of FidelityFX Super Resolution or FSR. This is AMD's long-awaited alternative that will attempt to upscale games from a lower render resolution to a higher output resolution, allowing for much higher levels of performance without a significant reduction to visuals, or ideally with the same visual quality. AMD aren't providing a ton of details just yet, but the first big talking point here is that we do have a firm release date, June 22nd. This is when we'll see the first game patched with FSR support, and it's perhaps a bit earlier than some might have been expecting. It's also when AMD will be sharing more information on FSR, so hopefully that's everything that won't be covered today. Next is the news of broad support. FSR is part of AMD's GPU Open program, and as such, it works on both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. That's right, FSR is supported on not just AMD's new Radeon RX 6000 series GPUs, but everything in NVIDIA's stack, including GPUs that don't support DLSS, like the GeForce 10 series. AMD specifically lists support for RX Vega, RX 500, RX 5000, and RX 6000 series GPUs, and all AMD Ryzen APUs with Radeon graphics. They won't be providing technical support on GPUs from other vendors, but we do know that FSR will work on NVIDIA GPUs from at least Pascal and newer. AMD also gave us a teaser for performance in two situations. The first is Godfall running on an RX 6800 XT using epic settings and ray tracing at a 4K resolution. Without FSR, the game was running at 49 FPS. With FSR using the ultra quality mode, performance increased to 78 FPS, so that's a 59% increase. That margin jumped to 2X using the quality mode and exceeded 2X in both the balanced and performance modes. AMD hasn't shared what render resolutions each of these modes are running at, but the performance claims are impressive, and we can see there will be a range of FSR options to choose from. These performance uplifts are in line with, or higher than, what Nvidia claims with DLSS 2.0 in the latest titles. But of course, this is just one game sample, and we have no idea how it was tested. The second performance teaser we got was actually on NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 1060 running Godfall again at 1440p epic settings. FSR running in the quality mode, so one step down from the highest mode, delivered a 41% higher frame rate and took the game above 30fps on average. AMD said they chose this demo because the GTX 1060 is the most popular GPU used today on Steam, and of course they want to boast about how FSR works on this GPU while DLSS does not. This performance uplift is lower than what we have seen previously at 4K using the 6800 XT, so that's something to explore in the future as there is a chance that FSR will not perform the same on AMD GPUs as it does on Nvidia. The big question mark out of our pre-briefing was on visual quality. We only saw two still images, no video comparisons, and certainly nothing in detail. This first image looks quite good, but I'm honestly not sure if each of these slices is actually a visual representation of the game running in each of the four modes. If it is, then that's promising, but I'm just not sure. The second image, there are clear differences between the left and right sides, and the FSR image on the right is obviously inferior, especially when you look at the differences between these two columns. The FSR image running at 1440p quality mode has less detail and is more blurry, so that's not as promising as the previous image. At the same time, there are still a ton of questions to be answered. This might have been shown as a video demo in the actual keynote presentation, so there might be a better look at it than what we got, but we were only shown this still image. It's also not running at the maximum quality mode, which for FSR is ultra quality, so this may not be a fair representation of the best that FSR has to offer visually. It's also not a great comparison as the left and right images are not the same, and there's quite a bit of motion blur going on, which may not be giving us the best look at the differences in detail. I guess the point is, is that we don't really have enough information to 
to make any firm early opinions on image quality. I asked AMD a number of questions about this and their answer to them all was basically that we'll have to try and use it for ourselves soon and assess the visual quality in depth. And of course, we should be able to do that around that June 22nd launch date. What we do know are two additional things. AMD are calling this a spatial upscaling technology. There is no mention of AI or temporal upscaling, although I would be surprised if there wasn't a temporal element that used information from multiple frames. No mention of better than native quality either, which most likely, just like with DLSS, would end up being a bit of marketing speak. We also know that FSR will work at many different resolutions, including at 1080p, so not just the 1440p and 4K shown here, it will work across a wide range of resolutions. The final thing to talk about is game support. Like DLSS, FSR requires per game integration. AMD is saying that 10 game studios and engines will integrate FSR in 2021 with an unspecified number of games. Obviously, Godfall is one, and we might see a games list as early as today on AMD's website. I heard more probably around June 22nd for the games list, but again, we, we weren't provided that one ahead of time. 10 games, so assuming at least one per studio or engine in the first six months of availability, would be a decent effort and better than what in Video achieved with the first six months of DLSS. At the same time, AMD is starting miles behind NVIDIA, which has been able to grow DLSS 2.0 support substantially in the 18 months since it was first deployed. We'll have to see how this ecosystem develops, and certainly we're hoping AMD doesn't pull an NVIDIA and just announce a bunch of games to get FSR, which then never actually are updated with FSR support. Before we move on to other announcements, overall AMD's FSR appears to be pretty promising in several areas. AMD are touting large performance increases and broader support than DLSS, with the the ability to run on both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs, probably as an attempt to kill off DLSS in favor of a more broadly supported upscale algorithm. There's still a lot to play out here, like image quality, that's really the key one, and of course game support as well, which hopefully we'll be able to dive further into when FSR launches on June 22nd. Next up, we have news of two new AMD APUs for the desktop market, the Ryzen 7 5700G and Ryzen 5 5600G. These APUs were previously announced in April for the OEM market, but will now be coming to the DIY market in essentially the same form. The Ryzen 7 5700G is an 8-core 16-thread processor using AMD Zen 3 architecture, clocked up to 4.6 GHz with 16 MB of L3 cache and a 65 Watt TDP. There is also a Vega GPU inside with 8 compute units clocked up to 2 GHz. This is the same Cezanne die that AMD are using for Ryzen Mobile 5000 APUs like the Ryzen 9 1900HX, so it is a monolithic design rather than chiplet based and has half the L3 cache but still features a unified CCX. Complementing this CPU is the Ryzen 5 5600G, which is a 6 core processor clocked up to 4.4 GHz, also with 16 MB of L3 cache, and with 7 Vega compute units clocked up to 1.9 GHz. The Ryzen 3 quad core option announced for OEMs is not being brought across to the desktop market, at least for now. AMD are positioning these processors as low-cost Zen 3 alternatives to the current X models with no integrated graphics that have been in the market for some time now. The company acknowledged that there has been a lot of demand for non-X CPUs, and apparently it's these parts that are set to fill that gap. Unfortunately though, these aren't really the low-cost CPUs many have been looking for. The Ryzen 5 5600G is priced at $260, US, so $40 less than the Ryzen 5 5600. Now this is cheaper of course, but it's not the $200 to $220 that many people were hoping a Ryzen 5 5600 would slot into. So even after this announcement, we still don't have a $200 Zen 3 processor of any kind. Your only option in this market are previous generation AMD products or Intel. The Ryzen 7 5700G sits between the 5600X and 5800X with its $360 price tag, and both CPUs will be available on August 5th. AMD provided some performance slides comparing the Ryzen 7 5700G to the Intel Core i7-11700, which is Intel's direct competitor at $370, and of course you can take these numbers with a grain of salt as they are directly from AMD. With that said, AMD do expect their integrated GPU to be much better than the iGPU Intel offering in Rocket Lake parts like the 11700. It will be quite interesting to see as well how these monolithic chips compare to the chiplet-based desktop processors already on the market in both productivity and gaming performance to see which approach is superior. I don't expect these new APUs to be as fast given the lower amount of cache and slightly lower clock speeds, but latencies 
will be an interesting discussion point. Lastly, we have the announcement of RDNA 2 laptop GPUs, which is set to be the start of a much bigger push for AMD into gaming laptops. We did see some RX 5000M GPUs hit the market in the last few years, and AMD has made several attempts at laptop gaming in the past, but the big issue for them has been efficiency. Nvidia simply has had the more efficient architecture for generations now, which has led Nvidia to dominate the laptop market, given efficiency is crucial for portable form factors. AMD are attempting to shift that narrative with the launch of RDNA 2 for laptops, bringing features such as very low idle power and real-time power cycling that are optimized for mobile form factors. Not only that, but the RDNA 2 architecture itself is simply a lot more efficient than RDNA 1, allowing for higher performance and or lower power draw depending on the circumstances. The highest tier laptop GPU that AMD are announcing is the Radeon RX 6800M, which is based on their Navi 22 GPU die, the same die that powers the Radeon RX 6700 XT on the desktop. Thankfully though, AMD are being sensible with naming, calling this product the 6800M, which should clearly distinguish it from the desktop parts, helping to minimize confusion. The RX 6800M features 40 compute units and 96 megabytes of infinity cache, plus game clock speeds up to 2300 MHz, which is only slightly lower than the 2424 MHz game clock for the desktop RX 6700 XT. The memory subsystem includes 12 GB of GDDR6 on a 192-bit interface. Despite the RX 6700 XT being a 230 watt desktop GPU, AMD are listing the mobile RX 6800M with a very similar configuration at just 145 watts, with that 2300 MHz game clock expected to be achieved at 145 watts according to AMD's specification table. We'll have to see how that plays out, but it does point to the 6800M being quite efficient. And just on those power ratings, AMD did say there will be some wiggle room for OEMs to customize that power level depending on the design they have and whether technologies are enabled like SmartShift, AMD's dynamic power allocation system that shifts power between the CPU and GPU as needed. However, AMD has not hinted at any sort of low power variants, so it doesn't sound like they will be going down the max Q route. These GPUs are all about full performance, and hopefully that will again lead to less confusion, as buyers won't need to figure out whether they are buying a full power or slower low power variant with the same name. The RX 6800M will first be seen in the ASUS ROG Strix G15, a laptop that I actually have on hand for testing right now, and you can expect to see benchmarks later this week. I believe the performance embargo is actually up right now, but we're still in the process of testing, and obviously there's a lot of news announcements at the moment. For now, here are AMD's provider benchmarks, which you should take with a grain of salt. They believe the 6800M will be between 1.4 and 1.7 times faster than the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070 for laptops, while delivering performance around the same mark as the newer GeForce RTX 3080 laptop GPU with 1440p gaming a target. Interestingly, AMD are also suggesting that the RX 6800M will deliver much better performance on battery than the RTX 3080, depending on the game. We don't normally test gaming on battery, but AMD did make a specific note on this, suggesting that RDNA 2 is particularly efficient at lower power levels that can be sustained on battery power. AMD are also announcing two other GPUs today. One is the Radeon RX 6700M, a cut down version of the Navi 22 die with 36 compute units at the same 2300 MHz game clock, along with 10 GB of GDDR6 memory on a 160 bit bus. 80 MB of Infinity Cache is included. AMD are listing this as a 135 watt GPU, which in comparison to Nvidia is similar to the upper end of the RTX 3070's range and the middle of the RTX 3080. Next is the Radeon RX 6600M using a new Navi 23 die that we also expect to feature on the desktop at some point. This GPU features 28 compute units and a game clock of 2177 MHz with AMD listing a 100 watt power limit. 8 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory is included here along with 32 meg of Infinity Cache. The first system to use this GPU should be an HP Omen 16 model and AMD are touting high levels of performance for 1080p gaming comparable to the RTX 3060 from Nvidia. As for availability, the 6800M and 6600M should be available now, while the 6700M will be available soon, and that's probably due to the 6700M relying on cut down silicon. I'm very excited to test all of these GPUs in the coming weeks to see just how well AMD can stack up to Nvidia for gaming performance in a laptop form factor, and whether we finally have some genuine competition in this space. The final thing AMD talked about was their new laptop program called AMD Advantage, which is essentially a laptop design and certification process to ensure the highest quality laptops using AMD hardware. 
The Advantage program combines Ryzen CPUs with Radeon GPUs, low latency 144Hz plus displays with full sRGB coverage as a minimum, fast SSDs, decent thermals and battery life, plus more. The two laptops that have been announced as part of this program are the previously mentioned ASUS and HP laptops, which are the first to use RDNA2 graphics. Anyway, that's pretty much it from AMD's Computex 2021 announcements. Again, I'm pretty sure this is going to be 90% plus of what AMD have shown in the keynote presentation. So if you're just after a recap, then I think we've covered most of the stuff here. Obviously, the big announcement here is for Dell EFX Super Resolution. AMD actually spent most of their time talking about the mobile processors in our briefing, but obviously FSR is huge as that is a key talking point for the desktop market in terms of competition between AMD and NVIDIA. What we didn't see was any RX 6600 GPUs or anything like that for the desktop market. There are obviously rumors floating around about those at the moment, but AMD is not ready to announce them just at this point. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We've got the AMD APUs as well coming for the desktop with Zen 3. So there'll be plenty of stuff for us to test in upcoming videos. So stay tuned for that. Uh, if you're interested in supporting our coverage, you can of course sign up to our Patreon and Floatplan accounts. Links to those are in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.